Welcome to Strip Coverlet. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for what I believe is the fourth in a 72 part series, a short story discussion, which will appear in two separate playlists on the channel. Number one being the short story discussion playlist, but number two being a short story by short story read along of the Finca Vigia edition by old Ernest Hemingway himself. We are here for Old Man at the Bridge. This is a story for which I did a video just about a couple months ago, but I had not started this read-along series at that point, so I wanted to get back in here and do this, and I have to say I think I had a bit of a different experience with it this time than I did last time, but we have a So What Happened portion where I break down what the story actually was, a lit crit portion where we talk about the literary criticism type stuff going on, and finally, a writer's corner. And in the writer's corner portion of this video, I have just one observation. So what happened in Old Man at the Bridge? Our narrator is trying to evacuate a small town when he notices a disheveled old man sitting on the side of the road. He engages the old man to try to get him to move along. The old man says he cannot go any further, and he talks about the animals he was raising. He's worried about them. Our narrator says that the animals will be fine. There are trucks just up the road, so you won't have to walk much longer. That is, more or less, what happens in this short story. So, where's this story take place? And I don't mean literally. I don't mean, well, they're in San Carlos or wherever it is that they're from, uh, wherever they are in in this story. I can't remember exactly the city they say, but... Barcelona, was it? I don't remember. Anyway, that's not what I mean. Where does this story take place? The story takes place between our narrator, a soldier who is trying to get this man to move along, and the man who says, I'm done. I'm just done. But there is so much nuance in this thing that is worth looking at because, look, we sort of live in a world that nuance is a word that triggers, right? Shouldn't be so. The nuance employed by Hemingway is the stuff of legend, and it's what makes these short stories so big, no matter how small they are. This quote here, where the narrator asks him where him from where he's from and he says from San Carlos he said and smiled seems like a little thing but what we have here is a soldier telling a guy hey move along and he says no but when we get down to it he's not obstinate He's just done. He's not here being angry at, at what's going on here. He's not being confrontational with our narrator. All he's doing is saying, no, I, I don't think I will. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from uh, San Carlos. Got a smile on his face. He's not being a jerk. He's just made his decision. And if you notice in this discussion... These two characters don't exchange names. Our speaker is experienced at trying to get people to move along. He's done this before. He has seen people break, and he has strategies on getting them to move along. You don't ask them for their name. That instigates conversation. You don't give them your name. They might ask about you, which instigates conversation, what you do is you ask about their life. Where are you from? Where are you from? It's not where you are going. It keeps the directive on movement. Now, oh, Barcelona's where they're going, not where, not where they are. 
And we get a little bit from this speaker, or not from the speaker, from the old man, that he doesn't have anyone in Barcelona. Those animals that he talks about, those were his reason to keep going, to keep living, not to keep moving, to keep living. He has been forced in this story to leave them. He has been forced in this story to leave his reason for living behind. That is why he's done. Maybe he's physically broken, but people get physically broken all the time and keep moving. People get physically broken all the time, and if they have somewhere to go, someone to see, they will keep on. Our character here has said, no, he's done. So, I have a couple questions about the text that I don't think I had the last time I made a video about the text. Number one... I want to go towards the end of this short story and look at this quote here. The old man says, I was taking care of animals, he said dully, but no longer to me. I was only taking care of animals. Now, I don't think I saw a second way to read that line delivery last time, or the line intent. The delivery could very well be the same. What I want to ask you, is this old man claiming to have lived an innocent life? Is he saying, all I was doing was raising animals in this war? came and uprooted everything. All I was doing is living a simple life, raising animals, and now I'm on the run like a criminal. All I was doing was raising animals, and now I have to be worried about them being shelled? I have to worry about explosives? All I was doing was raising animals, and now all of this mess around me, the fascists, the communists, all I was doing was raising animals, and all of a sudden... From that innocent life, here I am in this world of mess. Is that the way he's saying this? It's the way I assumed it last time. But I have a question. Is that what he's saying, or is he questioning the value of his life? We have him here giving up. At the beginning of the story, the man has given up. He's being told, hey, just get get over the hill. We got some trucks. You won't have to walk that much further. He doesn't care. Is that the type of is that the type of malaise which would wash over someone in the event that they realize they've lost their animals? Or is that the type of malaise that might wash over someone who realizes they've wasted their life? He has no one where he's from, only animals. He knows no one where he is, in transit. When he gets to Barcelona, there's no one there for him. Is the line, I was only taking care of animals, meant to express this man's innocence in life? Is he just in awe of the fact that you can be there living your quaint, innocent life, just raising animals, and be uprooted by war? Or is he saying, I was only raising animals. That's all I was doing with my life. Here I am, 70 years old. That's all I had? I had no children. I had no grandchildren. I had no friends. All I had were these animals. Is that what he's getting at here? Questioning that part of his life? I'm not sure how I read this story now. He's very 
preoccupied with thinking about these animals. Which leads us to want to believe that all he's saying is I was living such an innocent life. But I was taking care of animals. I was only taking care of animals. Has a much different connotation when you take into account the fact that this man is giving up ostensibly giving up life, giving up his life, and refusing, maybe, to keep going to a place where he has no one. Maybe it is that realization, in that place, I have no one, which is really being so foreboding for him. Now, I have another question. If we look at the story, Here's the end of the story. Did you leave the dove cages unlocked? I asked. Yes. Then they'll fly. Yes, certainly they'll fly. But the others... It's better not to think about the others, he said. If you were rested, I would go, I urged. Get up and try to walk now. Thank you, he said and got to his feet, swayed from side to side and then sat down backwards in the dust. I was taking care of animals, he said dully, but no longer to me. I was only taking care of animals. There was nothing to do about him. It was Easter Sunday and the fascists were advancing towards the Ebro. It was a gray overcast day with a low ceiling so their planes were not up. That and the fact that cats know how to look after themselves was all the good luck that old man would ever have. He got to his feet, swayed from side to side, then sat down backwards in the dust. Does the old man go on? Does he continue? Does he get on those buses, in those trucks? There was nothing to do about him. We don't know. We don't know, and that is part of the brilliance of an Ernest Hemingway short story. We have to make the decision, not that the decision was left undone by the writer, but the writer did not put that in the short story. I think, I think that's really what the short story is about. We have to understand for ourselves whether or not that old man goes on. Now, let's get to the writer's corner portion of this video. For this, I have but one note. Now, I want to ask you, before we get into that one note, what happened in the short story? We get the idea of war. We get a place that we're at. We get a place that we're from. We get a place that we're going. We have a prior life with this old man raising animals. We have here this little idea. Is he claiming a life of innocence and that's why he was only taking care of animals? Or is he questioning whether or not his life to that point had been worth living when it was only taking care of animals? We have the idea of the fascists coming. We have the idea of these soldiers moving around the hustle and the bustle. We have all of these things going on. We have that ultimate decision at the end, whether or not we believe this old man forfeited life, or if he did, go on. Did he go to Barcelona and find himself a couple goats to get along with? Get himself a new dove or something? Guys, 762 words. Barely over 750 words, and we have this entire world. We have two entire characters. We, we don't know a lot about our speaker, but we know he's no nonsense. We get that from the final paragraph. There was nothing to do about him. 
It was Easter Sunday, and the fascists were advancing towards the Ebro. That's plenty of characterization. We get the fact that this guy has done this before. He's very experienced getting people to move along. We have the movement, the idea of movement, and we have this ultimate decision whether or not we believe this old man moved along. Maybe we have two literary moments in the story, whether or not we believe the old man moved along and whether or not we believe that the old man is regretting his life. All of that in 762 words. That is a shockingly efficient short story. A shockingly efficient short story. There is a possibly apocryphal short little story about um, James Joyce, one of the contemporaries of Ernest Hemingway. They apparently got along famously. And one of James Joyce's friends came up, up to him, and he was languishing, just, oh, what is going on? What is happening? And um, his buddy said, James, what are you doing? What, what's so bad? And he said, I, I wrote seven words today. And his friend goes, yeah, but James, it's kind of a lot for you. You don't often write that much. It's a good day for you, isn't it? And James Joyce said, well, yeah, it's seven words is a lot of words for me, but now I have to pick what order they go in. That was the care with which this generation of writer delved into their work. Now, I could reach over my shoulder and pick up Twilight, which I read part by part in a series on this channel, and tell you, not a whole lot of care for words went into that novel. So, you know... And then, you know, not to say that no one in this generation does, but golly, the efficiency that you had to have with these words, especially when you were typing each of them out from a typewriter in order to submit them and you were not getting your manuscript back. That was a different type of care that necessitated a different type, a different level of editing. 762 words. We have two characters. We have both some of both characters' history. We have ideas about where each character is going. We have some great dialogue. We have two literary moments. In 762 words. This is a flash fiction. This is a flash fiction from Ernest Hemingway, 762 words, where we get so much story. That's the iceberg principle. But don't take it from me if you have not. So the iceberg principle, you've got the iceberg that you see above the water, but there's all this down here under the water. All you see is the peak, but there's so much more under the water. All we get in the short story is that what's peaking up over the water, but there's so much more going on underneath, and that's what makes it so rich. That's how so much can get communicated in just 762 words. That's all I have for this video. Old Man at the Bridge, the next video in this series, will be up in Michigan, and I hope to have you back for that one.